It was our responsibility to interview respected Holocaust survivors. We were given the task to discover what individuals who went through the Holocaust felt was the most important emotional, physical, and theoretical outcome from this cruel historical event. As we first met George Cronenberg and Erna Laufer, we understood that they were both special individuals who had survived through one of the largest and perhaps toughest, darkest parts of the Jewish people's history. When I think of George Cronenberg, I picture a man with good posture whose face remains calm and relaxed while doing any activity, even if it isn't the most enjoyable. He is comfortable with himself and his past, making our interview pleasant and meaningful, all emotion and expression related through his willingness to maintain eye contact, even when describing a time that wasn't enjoyable. Mr. Cronenberg was happy to discuss his story in any order, going deep in order to keep his and his family's legacy alive. He is the strongest survivor I've ever met. As I first saw Erna Laufer, she seemed fragile. She was prepared to tell her story, yet nervous. It was very difficult for her to tell her story, as she had clear memories of what had happened to her and she became very emotional. It was difficult for her to reveal those experiences, as she felt that she would scare us with her stories. It was amazing how clear her memories of the Holocaust were, how she could recall them in such detail, bringing tears to her eyes. Also, it was difficult for her to hear our questions, as she was the oldest survivor present. But she continued, anyways, knowing the importance of the future generations having the knowledge of her story. She is the bravest 95-year-old I have ever met. Both began their journeys on trains. George was 10 years old, going on the kinder transport, and Erna was in her early 20s as she was forced onto the trains to Auschwitz. And um, so they decided to take in 10,000 Jewish refugee children. And um, my parents, at that point, they, they knew there was no future for Jewish children in Germany, and they decided for us to go to England. And of course, they told us that we were going to go on a vacation, and that's how we, we went freely to go to England at that time. And, uh, but we, of course, naturally, we were hoping that our parents would follow shortly afterwards. They was a big building. They collected the people, the Jewish people collected. was a big train, okay, and packed us in like my cameras, okay, everybody, you know. I was with my family, my father, and, and my, a couple of sisters, okay, who came in, okay. Some of them never came in. My older sister never come back, okay. Both rows were difficult, and both survivors had lost their own beloved family members through this experience, some knowing that they would never see again and some hoping to see each other soon. When I left my father, he, they didn't let, talk it off on the train, okay? Me, they took off because me, me I went to Auschwitz. My father went to, to the crematorium. My father and my sister and with a little boy. During that period, we were able to get mail from our parents, and they were all ready to uh, come to England. But then the war broke out, and um, they were, of course, were not able to leave Germany. Unfortunately, they were sent to a concentration camp, and there they were able to write to us um, on a sheet 25 words, not just to let us know 
that we were doing okay, and we were able to answer on the same sheet of paper 25 words to let my parents know that we were doing okay. So during that period, after a while, the mail just stopped coming. We didn't hear from them anymore until later we found out that our parents were sent to Auschwitz. And in Auschwitz, my parents were murdered by the Nazis. So from the time my sister and I were 10 years old, uh, we never saw our parents again. Mr. Kronenberg was forced to leave his family and move to a new home, yet he was supported on his journey on the Kindertransport with toys and food to comfort him while he was traveling away from his parents, hoping that he would see them again. Looking back, this made such an impact on his life and how he felt about moving to a new country with only his sister to rely on. The train would stop at different stations. Dutch people would be very kind and they would give us cookies, toys and this sort of thing. After all, these were all small children. In other words, I'd like to say that Hitler only allowed children with the ages of infancy to 17 years old. If you were more than 17, England would not, uh, Germany would not let you leave. Of course, my sister and I, we were uh, 10 years old at the time. So that's uh, how we were able to leave. Mrs. Laffer explained the struggles of the lack of food within the camp, but the gratitude she has towards her cousin for the potato skins they gave her when she was starving from the lack of food given within the camps. My two sisters was in the working in a in a in a room where they peeling potatoes. Okay, they was lucky because they sometimes they could eat a little potatoes. Okay, this was Emma and Avia. Okay, and sometimes they would like to bring up for us, you know, something to steal to really bring us for that. At a certain point in both of their lives, George and er Erna each had their own emotional breaking point. For George, it consisted in him not seeing his own twin sister, whom he had traveled on the Kinder Transport with for a full six years. This additionally impacted his relationship, impacted his relationship with his sister later in life. The home. Now, my sister and I, we refused to be taken in by anyone because we were sure our parents were going to come shortly to England and we didn't want to be taken in by anybody. We used to hide behind the pillars. I mean, I lost, really I lost my childhood. And, um, and growing up without parents and uh, having gone through learn, learning a new language and uh, all these different situations that we encountered, it was a very difficult period. For Erna, it consisted of being stripped of her humanity and working in the bitterness and the harsh cold of Auschwitz. This is when Erna became the most emotional, having to relive some of the most difficult moments of her life. Her eyes began to water, and she continued on with her story with much courage and strength. We took out, they took us out, okay, five o'clock in the morning, take it naked, take off my suit, the dress that I have and hold it up like that, okay? And they, okay, at five o'clock in the morning and they st we stayed there all day in the court because it was winter, stay there. All right. All day, nothing else, nothing else could do. Sometimes they took us in the field, okay, to to share, to bring in some, like sweet potatoes, have to dig it out and bring it in for them, okay, for the Germans. After the war, life had changed completely for Mrs. Laufer and Mr. Cronenberg. Mrs. Laufer had to restart the life she once lived and try to continue past her horrible experience in Auschwitz. Her whole perspective of life had changed, which was very difficult for her to accept, as she was already in her mid-twenties. She now faced the task to reconstruct her whole life. 
when I went home in my home in Hungary. My home, I have a big home, a very nice home. Everything was empty. You don't have nothing there left. Everything still away. Okay, the only thing that I find, the rod where the, the drapes was hanging. Uh, only thing that I find, everything took it all. I took it. Nothing left. Nothing left. It was a beautiful home. For Mr. Cronenberg, life after the war allowed him to reunite with his sister and move to America to live with his extended family. There, he was able to continue his life and pursue academics, using his past experiences in England to guide him. And, uh, and actually, I went to school until I came to this country. Um, we were almost 18. I, my birthday is in July, and we left uh, England in June of 1946. And uh, so, and uh, so, when we arrived here, my uncle said to me, "George, what do you want to do? Do you want to continue your education?" Because I was just, I just turned 18 then, and um, so I said, "Well, if I can get a job, I would prefer maybe to get a job." And um, he happened to know the owner of American greetings. Throughout their experience in the Holocaust, these survivors felt there was three main themes that were most important for us to know. Mr. Cronenberg stressed the importance of respect and how it played a role in his life both during and after the Holocaust. Multiple times throughout the interview, he connected the responsibility of those who know survivor stories to being respectful. He believes that a large part of the Holocaust was a lack of respect, and if we can apply this integral message into our own lives and those around us, we can stop something like the Holocaust from ever happening again. Respect, as he believes, is the basis of our actions. It should be something we think about before we act, speak, and judge in any situation. Family played a major role in both Mrs. Laufer and Mr. Cronenberg's experience in the Holocaust. Mrs. Laufer's most emotional and clear memories from her experience are about her family and the impact they had on her. Her motivation to fight was for the future of the Jewish people and to grow old and to have her own grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Just, you want to know? No, I do it for you because I love you. Okay, she is my best friend. The whole reason why these survivors came to tell their stories was to ensure that their memories would never be forgotten. Although some may be more frightening than others or difficult to imagine, both Mrs. Laufer and Mr. Kronberg believe that these memories can never be forgotten. It is these stories that can bring hope to the Jewish people in a time of need and ensure nothing like this ever happens again. Because of this experience, we now understand our responsibility to the future of the Jewish people and what we must take away from these individuals. Something that stood out to us from both of our interviewees was that they both supported the concept of Tikkun Olam, fixing the world. We need to fix and mend the seams of what happened while remembering that those rips and tears once existed. Once we do so, we can move on, carrying the memories of our loved ones, families, and friends on our shoulders as a guide to lead us through whatever is thrown our way and to remind us of a core characteristics of our family, respect, and continuing the legacy.